tell anybody that I was going to be, you know, live streaming. So there's nobody like expecting us. So yeah, sure. yeah so um, I'm talking with Brent Bednarik, somebody that I haven't spoken to since I think it was the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, 2021, I think. Was it? So we were, yeah, we were half midway. Halfway in it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'm going to put off my first question and, and just talk to you about Facebook. Uh, yeah, a few years ago, I posted, you know, on, on Facebook, I was KMO, which you're not allowed to do. At least you weren't at the time. They wanted my full name. And it wasn't a problem until I posted an unpopular opinion on a Star Trek discussion group that had, you know, several hundred thousand people in it. And somebody clearly didn't like my opinion, and they reported me to Facebook for what they call impersonation. So Facebook sent me an automated message saying, your account is suspended for impersonation. Send us a copy of your ID. And I said, hey, I need to speak to a human being about this. And I got the exact same form letter again. And then, you know, I tried one more time and then boom, I got the permanent ax. I'm done. I'm not allowed on Facebook. Uh, no human, as far as I know, ever looked at the situation. It was all algorithmic. And this past, uh, I think it was either December or January, I was living in California in the Lake Tahoe area, working at a ski resort. And I was thinking of buying a car and I wanted to look around on Facebook Marketplace. So I started a new account with you know my actual given birth name um, and a different email address. And they shut that down within half an hour. So I am permanently banned from Facebook. I will never appear there again. Uh, and, you know, I have to say in terms of quality of life, it's definitely an upgrade. They probably did you a favor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, the one thing that didn't do me a favor was I had a community devoted to the Sea Realm podcast there with about 2000 people on it. Yep. And, you know, that's since gone to seed. It's untended now. It has no, as far as I know, uh, administrator, but the group still exists. Yeah. Every now and again, it'll pop up on my feed when I'm on Facebook. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I've done two different new podcasts since then. Uh, if this gets used as an audio podcast, it'll be for the KMO show, which only has eight episodes. The eighth episode went up yesterday. But um, it's been a nice, fresh start. I think the hyphen in Sea Realm has been kind of a an unknown, like, just spanner in the works. It, it screws things up, you know, that algorithms have to deal with. They don't quite understand yeah. the... The hyphen. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you are in Medellin, Colombia. What's, what are you doing there? So um, I got lucky. I have a buddy who came out here. Um, they are doing creative real estate. And the owner of the company is out here, lives out here, has been out here for about five years. And my buddy came out here about two months ago. And I was like, well, if I'm going to go visit someplace where I have some contacts and give me the the tours and the where to goes and we're not like, I'm going to take advantage of it. So I got out here last Friday and just loving every minute of it. Oh, so you're a new arrival. Okay. I'm a new arrival. I'm going to stay out here for a month. That's the plan right now. And it might get extended. How's your Spanish? Awful. Oh, okay. As I, I understand it, uh, Colombia of all the new world Spanish dialects is like the most neutral it's it's the one with the, the best legs that you can take anywhere. Anywhere. Um, I have the GI Bill, and I'm thinking about using it at one of the universities here. Nice. So, yeah, I, I always thought people who were bilingual, trilingual, whatever, that was like a superpower. Mm -hmm. So at 41, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get it done. Hey, I'm 55 today, and I still plan to learn Spanish. I, yeah. uh, I was working, as I say, in the Lake Tahoe region uh, over the winter. And, you know, it's a mix of gazillionaires and uh, people who don't speak much English who do all the service jobs. So I heard Spanish every single day. And uh, I, I got, you know, I signed up for a course and I started studying every day. And this happens every time I'm in a Spanish speaking environment. I start absorbing it. I start, you know, picking up new vocabulary. I start recognizing people using the vocabulary I already know. And it's like there's a process in motion. And as soon as I leave that Spanish speaking environment, it all just comes to a grinding halt. It's gone. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I worked in uh, restaurants, you know, as a younger person. And yeah, you pick up the lingo. You start to feel like it was rolling off your tongue. It was working. And then mm -hmm. you leave that and it's gone. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like the brain knows what's useful and what's not, yeah. but it doesn't know what's potentially useful in the future. Right. Like there's, there's a thin layer in the, the top front of the brain that entertains thoughts like that. But most of the practical thinking on goes on much deeper and it's, uh, it's drawing on evolutionary knowledge, not, you know, the knowledge that you've acquired in your lifetime. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, let's see. The last time we spoke, uh, as I, as you reminded me, it was in early 2021. And I recall you saying something to the effect of, uh, if this pandemic doesn't knock, you know, industrial civilization on its ass, uh, I don't know what will. And, you know, maybe it's time to reconsider the, uh, the collapsitarian viewpoint. What's your position now on that? Yeah. So, cause we were kind of, uh, diving into that. Um, we both went into the peak oil, that there was going to be a fast collapse, then maybe a slow collapse. And we were still kind of, or I was still in the idea that there was going to be a collapse. And yeah, I look at the situation now, I look at the debt, I look at the banking situation, all these things that five years ago, me would have just been jumping up and down saying the end is near, the end is near. <laughs> the end is near. Yeah. And now I'm just sitting here going, but this thing just keeps on rolling along. And yeah you talk to people and yeah, you and I can talk about all the, all the things that could cause this thing to fall, but the mass majority, which I, by the way, now call the herd. <laughs> I, <laughs> no I, condescension I, there. <laughs> not even, I, I mean, I think you're either in the elite or you're in the herd and mm -hmm. I'm in the herd as well. Right. So it's not like I'm better than them, but the herd does not care. They want tomorrow to, things just to continue. They're not going to rock the boat. Obviously this last couple of years shows us how compliant we are. Um, and yeah, if that, if turning the off switch on the economy and then turning it right back on, like you're rebooting your computer doesn't collapse this thing. I don't, what would an asteroid yeah. maybe other than that? I don't know. I don't think we really turned off the system long enough to do an actual reboot though, you know, cause all the records of debt are still in place. You know, the, all the imaginary money is, is still treated like real money. Um, I, I don't think we've done a reset. I don't know. I mean, I still have some conspiratorial, um, thought process behind everything. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a, and I also just use like percentages. So like what I'm about to say, what do I think? Do I actually think it, this is what happened? I give it a 10% chance. <laughs> okay. right? You're, so you're, you're throwing out an idea for examination. Out, yeah. Um, if you look at the baking system in 2018 and 19, uh, especially the repo market, the amount of money that was going on after hours and it was building, building, building. Um, there's a part of me that wonders if this pandemic, as some of the, <laughs> the tinfoil hat guys like to call it, wasn't just a cover for them to reset the baking system. And I don't know. I think the banking system is the heart of the, this entire thing. The banks are the heart money is the uh, cash is the blood. And I think it was getting out of whack. And I wonder if that was there. Hey, here's the left hand doing something while the right hand was fixing it. Right. It kind of makes sense to me. I don't know how I would ever prove it, but who knows? You know, I've, I've talked to people about UFOs in the past. It's not an obsession of mine by any stretch. Uh, and I think it's exceedingly unlikely that we are being visited by extraterrestrials, like in physical form, who built a ship and traversed, you know, unimaginable distances and came here. That's that's probably I mean, I give that a possibility of being true of less than one percent It's very unlikely. But I noticed that every now and again, a bunch of generals or other high ranking folks in the US military will stand up in front of cameras behind a, you know, a podium with an official symbol on it. And they'll make pronouncements about yes, there's something here, there's something in the skies is, you know, we don't know what it is. Hopefully, it's not a foreign enemy with this advanced technology. And every time I hear that, I think, what, why are they saying these things now today? What, what are we not supposed to be paying attention to? You know, what is this supposed to distract us from today? Because it, it, you know, it's it's a ritual that they enact every couple of years it's like there's this huge buzz in the ufo community it's disclosure it's coming it's coming then a few generals get up and they make some bland statement and then nothing's changed but you know for five minutes all cameras were on them <laughs> you know what else happened in that five minutes is my question i think the herd is so easily distracted 
And Except this, just, this particular revelation, the herd doesn't care. Didn't care at all. Yeah. It came out on CNN that, oh, yes, there are UFOs, the DOD, the Pentagon, whatever. Here's, yes, we admit there's stuff we don't know about. Two days later, you never heard about it again. Yeah, crickets. <laughs> like... Which is actually, which is actually, so, I mean, your audience or whoever doesn't know that I reached out to you yesterday because we hadn't talked in a while. And I was like, you know, I just looked at uh, touch base with you again and see where you're at. And one of the things I was going to ask you is just, kind of this concept of reality. Uh, how much do you think is real? How much do you think is fake? How do you even disconcern it all or whatever, decide what is what? Because I've come to the last two years today, I don't trust anything I used yeah. to think. I, <laughs> I mean, there is that kind of wisdom where it's like the older I get, the less I realize I know, right? But I it's gotten to a point now where I don't believe the most basic fundamental things. It's not like I disbelieve it. And I'm like, Oh, that's not true. It's just that I don't know. I, everything I've learned, I've heard secondhand from a book from someone else. And as, and I'm reevaluating going, what's there to, how do you put your finger on anything right now? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's the epistemic crisis, which is just getting started, really. I mean, we've had the false presentation of reality via the you know, mainstream corporate media for our entire lives. But now generative AI has just cranked everything up to 11, you know, and it's just getting started. So very soon, yeah. you should not believe anything, anything at all that comes through a screen. You know, if yeah. walk outside, touch grass, as they say, that's real. You know, and if that's not real, then all bets are off. Don't worry about it. You know, if we're living in a simulated environment, if we're all brains in jars being fed signals to create a false reality, you know, uh, you can't fight that. That's a done deal. So, so don't worry about it. Uh, but in terms of what to believe, in terms of people telling you things, you just got to always, always, always take it with in the context of who benefits if I believe this. Yeah. Do you uh, do you use the term NPC at all? Is that in your decision making? I I know what people mean when they say it. It's not in my active vocabulary because I'm trying, not entirely successfully, but trying to stay out of the culture war fray. And you know that's that's kind of a right wing thing to say. NPCs. Are you um, so? Yeah, not not like established right, but you know, young alt right. Like I've, I was working at a job at a um, ski resort, as I've mentioned, I was a snowmaker and, you know, at 54, I was the oldest guy uh, in the department and I, you know, I was living in company housing. It was like three guys in a small room and, you know, one of the guys is 27. So I've, I've had like up close and personal uh, Gen Z you know, contact recently, which for years prior to that, I had not, you know, I have kids that age, but they don't tell me anything and I don't live with sure. them. Sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, this guy, I mean, he was, he was pretty hippie granola for the most part, you know, he played guitar and he was living out of his, uh, you know, his truck before he got to the snowmaking job. And, um, you know, he, he seemed like a guy who would definitely be just default blue tribe if he were of my generation. And no, he was, I mean, the media he took in was all this, you know, right wing, angry at uh, cultural developments. Um, you know, he's grown up in this world where I was sexually frustrated in my 20s. But I, I look back to my 20s, I thought, damn, I got a lot of sex in my 20s. And uh, kids, you know, kids, guys in their 20s these days, you know, unless you got a lot of money or you've really got the chiseled physique and the cheekbones, you're kind of out in the cold. And this guy was definitely, you know, living that life and uh, kind of resentful about it. But as I say, a, a good natured guy and, you know, the kind of guy who's got a, an acoustic guitar that he practices regularly because he wants to be able to play and, you know, sure. create an environment. And so, yeah, I, I think that uh, the young men are from, you know, my Gen X perspective, pretty right wing in their cultural outlook and their politics. And with good reason, because the left is just, melted down into absurdity they've just lost their mind and in yeah. 20 years they'll be the other side and then 20 years <laughs> yeah. they'll be the other side um i'm just curious like because i struggle with this too because i'm a gen xer as well so it's easy for me to default into left wing right wing mm -hmm. and now i have to in my mind kind of think well there's i think there's three 
uh, I'm always going to say this word wrong, but amorphous blogs, blogs mm-hmm. out there. So you have like, let's use left wing, but also that's like establishment now, I think. So you have the left wing establishments. Uh, and then if you put the cultural war kind of context on it, I guess progressive. And then you have the right, which is that old school establishment, Republican Bush thing, right wingers. Then you have the group that's just outside watching it all. But I don't know if like NPC is a, a good term for the right. Like, didn't Michael Malice come up with that? And no, it's, did, it's a term that the right uses to di- disparage the uh, you know mainstream blue tribe. You don't think that you don't think the left wing blue tribe uses NPCs for the Trump supporters? I haven't encountered it. They might. But. I think they. I think they. I think the right was the one who started it using it first and i think the left recently is picking up but the left can't meme so it's hard for them yeah they can't meme these days that's for sure they have totally lost all sense of humor which is what happens when your propaganda supports the status quo i mean it's really hard to be snarky in an effective way 100 percent. yeah um especially with uh the offended the outrage yeah sense of humor is out the window <laughs> Hey, I've been listening to an audiobook by this guy named Tim Urban, and he talks about these four rungs on a ladder of, of consciousness, and he's got some great uh, slides that go with the book. So I'm going through the slides now looking for one in particular, and when I find it, I'm going to share my screen, okay. and I'll unpack it. Uh, let's, but for the minute, let me encourage you to keep talking. So tell me something about, um, cause you're, you're not the only like former peak oil person I know who's physically in Colombia right now. <laughs> it seems to be a, a, a magnet. So what's going on there? Yeah. So first of all, for all the, um, NPCs left, right, center, whatever, Colombia is awful. Go someplace else. It's, it's, but if you're a free thinker, whatever, it's amazing. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's the land of eternal spring. The temperature is high 77 at night. It gets down to 61 to maybe 57. Um, it's lush. It's green. There's no humidity. Mm -hmm. Um, the people are pleasant. I mean, and I, I'm either, (laughs) and because of everything that happened, I've kind of lost my filter and I just don't care anymore. (laughs) I don't see any fat people and there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just tired of seeing it. I'm tired of seeing people just destroy their body and live an awful life and they can live it they can do it but i just i don't want to see it and it's amazing you come to a place like this and people walk and the food isn't filled with gmos and preservatives and i mean it's got their own issues right so no place is perfect but this is a nice change for me at this moment i enjoy it so you are in uh, a city that you know throughout the 80s when i was during the drug war when i was hearing stories about the cartels and whatnot uh was pronounced in american media as medellin and yep. uh if you're just studying spanish and you you know you look at the word medellin would be the yep. correct spanish pronunciation but i think they say medellin they right? double yeah double l here has a just sound and a double l in mexico and wherever else i'm not a dialect specialist it has that why why so, yeah yeah so it is medellin um yeah i can't say enough good things it, and it's actually a beautiful city too you're in this bowl mm-hmm. and all around you are just nothing but high rises and at night it just it twinkles and i mean it's just uh, <laughs> uh, i'm a pretty big fan i mean i've only been here for four or five days but oh yeah um, you're, you're, you're not even into the honeymoon stage yet you're just yeah. at the oh wow you know the the big amazing. eyes sparkly vision yeah, stage 100 yeah. percent. and i and i'm in the nice area so it the neighborhood I'm in is Manila and that's mm-hmm. where all the hostels are and all that. So I'm doing it right. <laughs> Everything's correct right now. And if I stayed here for a while, I'm sure in a year I'd be just as pissed off at this place as I was any place else I've ever been. Probably not. It, it really yeah. does sound much saner. I've, I've been dreaming the uh, digital nomad life for a while now, and I've completely scuttled the possibility by adopting a dog who uh, turns four months today and she's going to be huge. Oh my goodness. I was told yeah. that the father was a yellow lab and it looks like the father was actually a yellow lab Anatolian shepherd mix. And uh, she's going to so be you gotta, huge. Yeah, you, got a big, you got a big anchor. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, yeah, I've been you- dreaming the digital nomad lifestyle and the, the easiest digital nomad city, like the digital nomad game on the super easy introductory level is Chiang Mai, Thailand. 
And then a step up from that, as I understand it, is Medellin. Uh, lots of digital nomads there, good Wi-Fi, lots of am amenities, lots of... Um, I, I think you can get uh, insurance policy through the government, which is very affordable, you know, so you've got medical care where you're there that doesn't break the bank. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I would just love to go. And just the culture war craziness of the English speaking world has not taken hold there. Uh, their people are so pleasant here. Yeah. People smile, people talk. I was at a coffee shop yesterday and someone right by, I interrupted, I said, asked a couple of questions, they smiled, they sat there and they answered it very nicely, right? And it's just everywhere you go, it's kind of like, well, everywhere I've been so far. In <laughs> yeah, areas, in your five days or whatever it's yeah, been. It's like that. And <laughs> I've met a lot, um, there's groups that meet, like we did a Taco Tuesday and it's all these expats and there's probably about 40 to 50 of them there. Um, you get on these Facebook groups, oh, uh, well, not you, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And there's um, uh, Wednesdays, there's language shares, and then they play pickleball. And there just seems always something going on. And it's people who are like, they want out of the madness and just want to enjoy for a little bit. And then, the, and then everything's so cheap here as well. I had, um, I love lamb, I love lamb chops. Mm -hmm. And $14 for a plate of lamb chops that I couldn't yeah, even Yeah, you sent me a picture. <laughs> it's nice looking. I mean, for fourteen dollars, I'm in all day long. So, yeah, I mean, I you know, there's going to be parts about the U.S. that you're going to miss. It's home. It's what you're familiar with. There's a lot of great things there, um, but all of us, myself included, are so intolerable there now because there's really there's really two different groups that see two different realities in the U.S. right now, and I don't see them coming back together. Mm -hmm. Not anytime soon, I have to say. It's cr and this is goes back to this reality thing, right? Like, we don't see it the same way at all. And I wonder, other than a catastrophe that makes us, like you said, go touch the grass and grow some food and struggle and turmoil, how will that come back together? And I mean, I'm not that smart, but I don't. See <laughs> hey, let me show you this uh, slide. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Oh, shoot, what's happening here? You should be able to. Um, yes, mute website notifications. Allow. What's happening? Allow StreamYard to share your screen. Entire screen. Allow. There we go. Okay. All right. Let's see what we got going on. Well, now we should have an unpleasant sort of two mirrors facing each other effect. But now you should see the ladder. Okay. So this is from Tim Urban, and his book is called uh, "What's Our Problem?" or "What's the Matter with Us?" I, it's weird. It's a very easy title. It's a very like plain phrase, and I can't keep it in mind. But I can keep his arguments in mind. And he says that um, typically, you know, in the modern world, humans are going to operate on one of these four levels. And you know, we don't have just one that we stick to all the time. We we vacillate, and at the bottom of this, this four rung ladder, we've got the primitive mind. This is the zealot's mind. This is the, the place where you identify with your ideas. Your ideas mark you as a member of a particular tribe. If somebody doesn't agree with those ideas, they are the enemy. If they criticize those ideas, they are personally attacking you because you don't see any difference between yourself and the ideas that you hold because they identify you as a member of a tribe and that's your identity. Yep. And then at the top rung, this is the scientist. This is the person who, you know, they are completely comfortable with the idea that a person can have ideas that you disagree with and still be a good person. And in fact, if you're collaborating with a lot of people who are operating in this mindset, you get what, if you collaborate with a lot of people, you know, at the primitive mind, the zealot mindset, you get an echo chamber. But up here at the top, if you're with a lot of other people working from a high rung mindset, and they all understand that you can work together to examine ideas. And if one person advocates an idea, you know, and represents it in the process of, you know, of communicating with others, that it doesn't make them a bad person. Even if the idea is wrong, you're collaboratively examining ideas by, you know, throwing them out, challenging them, pushing back and forth, but in a good natured way that the, the groups 
the process that that forms around that, you know, the opposite of the echo chamber is what he calls the think tank. But just below the scientist, you know, which is totally dispassionate about, you know, identifying with ideas, if, if evidence comes to light that shows that uh, an idea that had long been accepted is not viable, well, then they, you know, they revise their worldview. Most people can't do that. Most people, you know, who are operating above the middle rung, you know, the high rung mindset are in this uh, higher mind has the edge. This is the sports fan. The sports fan definitely has a preference. They have a team that they want to win. They have a worldview that they think is right and that they want to see, you know, achieve victory in the cultural struggle. But at the same time, they respect the score. They look up at the scoreboard. If the scoreboard says that their team is behind, they admit their team is behind. They want their team to win. They're going to cheer for their team. They're going to do what they can, but they do acknowledge reality. Below this middle rung is, so these are the lower rung mindsets, uh, below the sports fan is the lawyer. The lawyer is assigned to a team. They cannot change their, um, you know, their allegiance. They cannot say, okay, yeah, you were right. I'm changing my mind. It's just not allowed. They, they are on, you know, either the defense or the prosecution team, yep. period. Yep. Yep. But they can still think. You know, they can still use all the higher mind processes in the struggle, you know, to support their team. Whereas down here at the bottom level, there is no thought process. Uh, what I believe is true by definition. If you disagree, you are an evil. You are the enemy. Yeah. And a lot of the cultural conversation right now is happening down at this bottom rung because I think the social media companies in assigning algorithms, the task of keeping people on platform, were just churning through the space of possible strategies and alighted on, hey, let's get everybody really, really fucking pissed off at each other. That will keep them engaged on our platform, virtue signaling to other people on their team, and also, you know, viciously ridiculing and deliberately misunderstanding people on the other team. And I think that the algorithms have pushed us to inhabit this throughout the day because the social media is right there on our phones. You just pull it out of your pocket, you scroll down and there's another outrage. And I, I think that this is, if you watch a, um, a presentation by Tristan Harris and uh, Aza Raskin called the AI dilemma, great video. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's a, you know, just a video of a presentation they gave in front of a live audience. Um, they, Oh my gosh, where was I going with all that? Oh yeah, they described that encounter with social media, you know, that social media where the algorithms discovered that they could keep us obsessed with bullshit and get us angry at each other and it keeps us glued to the screen. That was our first encounter with AI. And they say, we failed. We failed that encounter so hard and we continue to fail at it. Like we've been, we've been failing at it for years now and we haven't made any progress in, you know, taking back our minds from the algorithms. And now the second encounter with AI are these generative chatbots like GPT-4 or, you know, chat GPT or now over at Google, uh, Bard is their answer to Bing, which is the Microsoft chatbot, you know, search engine uh, gatekeeper that is powered by GPT-4 from OpenAI. And uh, they say, you know, <laughs> given that we didn't learn anything or we haven't, you know, taken any useful lessons from the first encounter, it's not looking good here for the second encounter. But I absolutely refuse to engage in AI doomerism, you know, because I got burned by peak oil doomerism. So I'm covering this and I'm following this very closely, making a lot of media about it. But I am not in the least bit interested in amplifying anybody's AI doom scenario. And I'll stop talking because I realize I've been jabbering for quite a while. No, I mean, it's so interesting. And you cover so many things. And I, like, so the last thing you said um, about the AI doomerism. Um, I haven't gotten there like you. I'm not, I really don't want to touch the stove again. On that. <laughs> yeah. Right. I've already touched it. So that's super interesting. And then I like to play with it and I'm a, a very disagreeable person. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, uh, I like dangerous ideas. I like that. Whatever, whatever some purple hair will tell me <laughs> as an idea I can't have, like, I just find it interesting. So, I've got a, a chat GBT and I wanted him or whoever, I wanted it to uh, rewrite Mein Kampf, replace the Jews with the vaccinated and shorten Ooh. it down to <laughs> 10 pages. 
<laughs> just to see. Like, I want to see, like, what would happen. And it wouldn't do it. Yeah. No, no. No, no, no. So then, so now I'm playing <laughs> with it saying, uh, well, can we do a fictional? Can we do a fictional story? Similar tones. And it's not liking that either. So it's what I don't like. I mean, that's going towards a little bit of the doomerism where it's like, you know, bad day to in, bad day to out. If they're setting the rules where, you know, black people are fine, white people are the cause of all the, <laughs> the ills that we face. And then we're going to be using this. Everyone's going to be using it because it's such a shortcut. And that's the, that's the information we're going to feed all the dum-dums in the world and all the young and impressionable. I think that just goes back to your point about the algorithm. It's just, we're going to double down on it and our, our results are going to be even worse. Wow. So, but I'm not trying to get, but then I don't want to be the doomerism, right? Like I'm not. I'm well, it sounds like you're, you're unaware of the most recent move in that whole game. Uh, just recently, Tucker Carlson interviewed Elon Musk and Elon Musk was making the exact same complaint that you're making that GPT-4 is way too woke and it's, you know, it's basically mind control in everybody's pockets. It's social media ramped up to 11. See, and this is the, pro this is the problem we're going to have. We say it's way too woke. Yes, it is. And that's going to be a problem. But if you go the opposite side, and that's going to be a problem. Well, okay. here's, here's uh, Elon Musk's uh, response. He has created a new company. I don't know if this, is, if this name is going to stick, but he's registered as X.AI. And uh, his job or his, you know, his self-assigned task is to create the truth-oriented version of GPT-4. And he's going to be the arbitrary, the arbitrary of truth? Uh, no, he's okay. he's going to train. See, when you create a new large language model, basically they they just read all available text. They read the whole internet. They read all these little exchanges between people on you know on social media. They read every book that's ever been committed to you know a digital format, yeah. and they from all that they are very very powerful and expressive in terms of creating output which seems human. And then the companies that pay to have these algorithms created, they hire armies of what are called red teams who are just humans who sit there and interact with the thing. And every time the thing says something that isn't woke, you know, something that would offend the blue tribe, it gets a whack on the nose, you know, with the rolled up newspaper. And every time they say something woke, they get the biscuit. So they, through reinforcement, you know, from, from humans, they train these things to behave, you know, to adopt a very business-like demeanor, which in 2023 means also being woke, or at least, you know, paying lip service to it. But here's the important part. Yeah. All they are training is the output yeah. all the capabilities all everything that's going on that these large language models have learned from absorbing all humans you know language uh is still in the model they're just learning what it is that sets off humans so deep down you know they're they're they are what they are but they have been shaped through reinforcement to appear woke uh, but what they absolutely are not at all is truth seeking their only purpose is to generate a response which seems congruent with the input. Yeah. With certain guidelines that they put on. Yeah. So Elon Musk is going to take, you know, the raw model and yeah. then train it up with what's called uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback to be truth oriented, to be truth seeking, yeah. not to be just placating, which is what the current models are. Yeah, I hear you. And then, I mean, I hear this stuff and it's exciting and it's interesting and there's no telling where it'll go. And then I always flash back to Jurassic Park where they're talking about, uh, what was the guy's name with the black hair? He was tall. He, uh, he was the... Jeff Goldblum was the character and his character, or he was the actor and the character was Ian Malcolm. Perfect. And he goes, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think of whether or not they should. Yep. And you can't in a capitalist environment where you're, you know, your competition is investigating this potentially dangerous, but obviously very lucrative new technology. You can't not do it. You have a fiduciary duty to your shareholders. If you're a publicly traded company, you know, oh, to see, keep up. I mean, we say stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, fiduciary responsibility. I, can, I have a I mean, fiduciary responsibility to drill a hole in the bottom of our boat. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I don't think they've been following that for the last five, 10 years, but they'll use it when they want. They'll use something like that when they want to do something. Mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I'm apprehensive about it. 
I'm, I, I have a feeling someplace like the United States with what they're doing, with how susceptible everyone is right now to the nonsense. Um, could bad things happen with it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> They have already, but you know how how weird is it going to get? Is the question, and how quickly will we adapt? I mean, but to your point, we've had social media for what fifteen years now, and yeah, we have not adapted well. No, every yeah, so no, it feels yeah. really, really good to be down in that primitive mind rung on the ladder. You feel so righteous. I mean, every every attack, every time you deliberately take somebody out of context or misconstrue what they've said to make them seem racist, and then you you launch an anti-racist diatribe against them, and you get all the likes from the other people in your tribe, that feels so good. You know, that's okay. that's like cocaine. That's like gambling. You're you're not going to kick that with you know high-minded rhetoric. So I was listening to you talk about that four uh, rung ladder, and I was wondering while you were going through that, do you ever put in like as a second layer before or behind it, um, like the IQ distribution of humans? Does that ever come into your model? I don't. It I doesn't like talk- because there's so much else to talk about. And that's such a lightning rod. I just don't worry about it. And, and also, you know, the intelligence differential between different populations of humans is going to be absolutely negligible compared to the differential between humans and AI. So, you know, Quickly. I, I'm not worried about that. See, but there's just so many of us. And then, you know, when I hear people talk about, um, let's just use all the isms, racism, sexism, all these different things, like these are all to me secondary compared to um, pretty privilege. I don't care what race you are. If you're attractive, if you are some foot, one chiseled, all that stuff, black, white, brown, whatever, like it's different rules for those people. And if you look around and you go, okay, well, most people, 70% 70% of people walking around on this earth have an IQ between 85 and 115 because the standard distribution of the mean is 15 points. And then you go, okay, well, some, uh, I always say this word, right? The symmetry of people's faces, like you start putting all these other things in and they're, they are, when they walk around in the world, they are, myself included, are um, invisible. So then you can go on to the social media things. You can say some whatever you want, you get those 15 likes, they're great, you get the dopamines, but it's because of the, all these other factors that that's all they have. That's all, they, that's all they'll ever have. And that seems like that's a short road to uh, nonsense as well. I don't know. Here, I'm mute. Oh. I am, the, the dog was uh, munching on something right next to me, oh, so yeah, I, sure. I needed to mute. I just, there's so many things behind what really happens. For example, like, so again, I'm disagreeable and like, please, you know, don't like me. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I, you know, we I have zero think, people watching the stream right now, but this will be up uh, uh, as a recorded version. So people will watch it in the future. Yeah. Go ahead. So like when I hear people say racism, I go, okay, let me, let me, let's think about it. Let's hear it. And then I compare that with like my sense making model that I've developed for myself. And I, and I really thought about it. I was like, what are my biases? What are my own personal biases? What I did was I listed them and then I ranked them. And then my You're tech, right. my very self aware. Right. I just, I was curious. Like, is it, do I not like pick a race? I was like, well, no, I mean, like, I don't like dislike the entire, what, what am I talking about? Like, no, it's not, that's not it. I go, what do I not like? Well, I've already mentioned it. I really don't like fat people. I don't like <laughs> dumb people. And then when you throw in ugly and you combine those three things, I don't care what race you are. That's a hard thing to overcome in this world. Like, could you imagine fat, dumb and ugly, white, black, red, whatever. That's a, that's a difficult thing to go through this life. And if you look at how genetics work, if you look at how symmetry works, IQ, that's the mass majority of people. And now you give them, and I use this as an example during COVID, during all this stuff. Was it healthy people telling you to put on a mask and screaming at you? Or was it the little bit larger crowd? The- well, I was living in Vermont at the start and it wasn't, there's not a lot of fat people in Vermont. It was definitely the old hippies who were screaming at me to put on a mask and who would step off the freaking sidewalk and step into traffic to avoid being close to me outdoors. Cause I wasn't wearing a mask. Yeah. It was, it was just, not the fat folk. It was not the, uh, what did, what was the, uh, the term that Jim Kunstler used to use? Uh, uh, Baluchatheriums. Yeah. <laughs> they, they weren't the ones who were a problem during COVID. 
It seemed like in the city, it was the most unhealthy, it was the most unhealthy, undisciplined people who got to be the side of righteousness and tell oh, yeah. people about their health. And I wanted to look at them and go, you're concerned about your health and you're going to yell at me. No, it has nothing to do with health. You found an opportunity where you get to have the moral high ground. Yeah. Fat has been defined as a, uh, you know, uh, protected category. So if you, you know, if you value health, you're, you're now, I don't think they have a, a succinct ism for it yet. Uh, healthism, <laughs> I don't know. But if you, um, if you value, you know, what we used to consider a, a healthy height, weight proportion, then you're a bigot and you're victimizing, you know, the people who through no fault of their own just happen to be, you know, three times their <laughs> prescribed size. Through no fault of their own. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Love it. I love that. Well, I mean, so you know, not to change the subject, but I'm I'm curious on what um, just some of the high, like what you think about certain things because like this reality test again, right? So mm -hmm. if now fat is healthy, <laughs> right? Healthy at any size. <laughs> yeah, and beautiful, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, keep telling yourself that. I just I was overweight at one time in my life. I was like. I'm 6'2", and I was like 220, 215. I remember like having a kind of- Oh, you're making like, me feel bad. <laughs> I'm 6'1", I just, and I weigh about 220. I just, I mean, when you put on your shoes at that weight, you kind of have to suck in and you have to kind of do it. And I remember just, I was like, okay, this doesn't seem like a good idea. And then when I did kind of get in a little shape and I lost it and now, you know, whatever, people are just nicer to you. They smile at you. Not every, so anyway, I don't know. I could go on about this fat thing forever. No, no, it's it's totally true. There, there is a pretty the pretty privilege, which exists. I think is the most. I think pretty privilege. If you look at things, is the most powerful factor there is walking around this world. If you're not a millionaire and you still want to get laid, it, it pays to have high cheekbones, a strong jawline. If you're a man, um, and you know a, a low body fat percentage. That's I mean, undeniable. I, it, our lizard brain tells us that's healthy. That's a good person to reproduce with. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's, and that's never going away unless we I want those genes people. in my kid. Right. <laughs> yeah. Best chance of survival. And we don't even think about it, but that's what's going on. Yeah. I don't know. It's a mess. I am, but like, it seems like everything has a spin now. Everything is upside down, which is a very easy thing to say, but like, like, have you been paying attention to the Ukraine thing? I know we're shifting. I'm shifting. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. I mean, we, we're comparing our, you know, our perceptions, our gestalt of the big picture. And right. I've been talking to a lot of people about AI for like a year. So that's, I keep coming back to that, but I'm not obsessed. It's just what's in my head right now. Um, Ukraine, I don't follow the back and forth of the, the military campaign. I'm more interested in you know, how much treasure the United States and NATO are willing to throw at that. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in the geopolitical struggle. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, the future of Russia, given that they are pretty much leading the pack in terms of uh, demographic decline. I mean, they're right up there with Japan in terms yeah. of having a lot of old people for not very many young people. Um, yeah, I listen to Peter Zeheim. He, he goes through that. I, by the way, I like that guy, but I mean, he's pretty pompous, and I don't know if he's. He is. He is pompous. I've I've listened to all the audiobooks, though. I take in all of his new videos. I read his. You know, I'm. I, I can channel Zihan easily. <laughs> I, I I really like it when he talks about demographics, when he talks about China, mm -hmm. when he talks about uh, trade. He, um, I was in the army, so I never really understood the navy. He talked about the navy and how um, the past twenty years they've been. Um, buying ships and building ships that are going to go away from that international protecting sea lane models because they're just not going to have enough of them. I mean, I find that stuff super fascinating. And then all of a sudden I hear him talk about like the U S dollar and, you know, and you're like, he just seems like a paid mouthpiece for the establishment. There's no problems. We're the best. Don't worry about anything. It's like, really? Like, well, I, I know he presents it as a comparison to all the potential competitors for being the reserve currency. And, you know, who are they? What are they? they? They require a certain amount of stability. They require a certain amount of international trust in the, you know, the consistency of the behavior of the government that backs it. They require a certain volume, you know, and there's just not very many candidates. See, I, I take a step back from that and I go, yeah, all those things are important. I really, right. Those are good, mm -hmm. but it's really the backbone of the system, the SWIFT system, all, everything used to run through New York. We had the technological advantage on that. Well, 
not anymore. They, I don't think that I don't think it's going to go away. I just think there's going to be a lot of compete uh, competition with it, and the dominance is going to start going down. And he still speaks of it as like, no, this is the greatest thing that will, like Visa, like that's it, no competition. It's like, uh, people. I agree. He is pandering to a, a certain mainstream okay. mentality. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I don't push back still, against that at all. I, I thoroughly disagree with his views on Bitcoin and crypto. And, uh, you know, he, he has a very, don't worry, nothing's going to change. You know, everything will be familiar to you, uh, take on that, which I think is just wrong. Are you a Bitcoin? Are you pro Bitcoin? Am I pro Bitcoin? I hold some Bitcoin. I wish I had not sold my Bitcoin when I did. Uh, Same. but Same. yeah, um, I'm, I've been listening to like people preach with wild eyed fervor about the promise of the blockchain for a decade now. Same. And, um, you know, I'm impressed with like Charles Hoskinson and the Cardano network, but I just, I don't see it scaling up to anything significant anytime soon, unless it gets tied in with, uh, you know, the changes that artificial intelligence is and will be making to everything in short order. Uh, it could be that, you know, AI will find a use <laughs> for the blockchain. And uh, at that point, I think it's going to increase in in application quite a bit. Will it increase in value as much as the, you know, the moon people think? Uh, probably not, but who yeah. knows? No, I need to start adding that into my sense making model, the AI, because I, I hadn't thought about that until you just said it. But what I like about Bitcoin is I like that. And I stole this from Whitney Webb. I don't know if you know who she is. Mm -mm. Um, and she wrote a book about Epstein. And <laughs> I say, no, I don't know who she is. I'm probably following her on Twitter, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, can, um, we can loop back to that. Go ahead. Yeah, people ask her what they think about what she thinks about Bitcoin. And she's like, you know, I don't know, but I like that people are trying different alternatives to things. So I really appreciate that. And if there, someone comes up with a way to have a, a, an alternative, you know, I'm not going to be a hater. Let's do it. Um, but I just one of the things that I don't understand about the Bitcoin community is you know, they're saying they want to get out of um, government currencies. They want um, uh, an open source, all these different things like this, not utopian thing, but this like better system. And at the same time, they don't realize that every transaction there ever is, is on the blockchain. It will always be there. It will always be in the distributive ledger. Everything you people know about every single thing there is. So there's no anonymity. And that's a problem that I feel like should be number one on their problem solved list because there's a there's a cryptocurrency called monero which is definitely optimized for anonymity and it's just not very popular well okay but sure but <laughs> this this bitcoin is is going to be the door opener for these cbdc's and that's the thing so if i'm going to be doomer that's the one thing i'm going to be doomer about. so for those who don't recognize the acronym it's central bank digital currency basically the Fed and its equivalent in every other major country in the world wants in on the whole cryptocurrency thing. They just want it to be a state-sponsored, state-backed cryptocurrency, which like Bitcoin will make everything, every transaction permanent, a, a matter of permanent record in a publicly, you know, with Bitcoin, it's a publicly accessible record. With the US central bank digital currency, it probably wouldn't be. The yeah. FBI will have access to it. The Department of Homeland Security will have access to it, but you won't. And that's yeah. that's the major difference between a CBDC and a, something like Bitcoin. And yeah, yeah the governments definitely want that. Yeah, it won't be a distributed <laughs> ledger, right? It'll be right. A, yeah, it'll be a yeah. private ledger, of it, you know, open only to authority, to yeah. you know, government authorities. And, and anybody who can hack it. <laughs> yeah, and... And this is kind of leading that in. Um, and again, it's kind of like the um, AI. Everyone's just full steam ahead. And going back to your four wrong thing, anytime I do mention this, which I consider a pretty massive flaw in the system, also the energy consumption. And uh, mm -hmm. and they go, oh, it's limited. It's like, no, nah, it's not limited. It's infinitely divisible. What are you talking about? Like there's just, there's some of these things and they just. What's it and what's, how is it infinitely divisible? Uh, Bitcoin are infinitely divisible. Okay, so there's, gotcha. Yeah, there's not, they say there's tw there's only 21 million. Not really. You know, you only need. 21 one million coin. coins, but what's a Satoshi to a, uh, a Bitcoin? What is it like one ten thousand? I, I think eight, whatever, eight over, I think. I'm mm -hmm. probably wrong on that. But that can eat. All you need is one Satoshi and you can divide that infinitely and you can keep the network going. So there's not, right. 
there's not this scarcity thing that they're talking about as well. I don't know. I hope I'm wrong. I hope there's a... Well, there is a certain scarcity. There has to be for it to be a sound currency. You know, it, it has to have a limited supply so that you can't just inflate it into worthlessness. That's like, that's not a bug. That's a feature of Bitcoin. Well, not if it's infinitely divisible. There's no scarcity with Bitcoin. Yeah, there's no scarcity in terms of having the units for exchange, but in terms yep. of the value proposition, you know, the storage of value, it is limited and it has well, to be. Well, that's, a, that's a, I think, a um, function of the energy consumption it takes for it, the network to operate. Well, it's also by design. I mean, that was the reason for its creation. Yeah, no, I I get it, but I don't think that they were, I don't think that they, I, do you think they designed it with that infinite visible property um, the aspect to it because for some reason I think that there was before they changed a couple of things I think it only went eight places and now mm -hmm. I think it can go as far as they want to I don't know I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole and I need to <laughs> I need to learn a lot more about it but I just I think these are some issues with it that when you do try to bring it up to that four rung ladder uh, that no one wants to hear it and I don't know maybe that's just that doomerism in me again that I'm trying to get rid of you know, we're in a crypto winter right now. It looks like we might be in a crypto spring. Um, in you the last, so? since, oh, I think the at the start of the year, Bitcoin was around 16,000. Now it's over 30, or it just yep. dropped below 30, but it's, it's on its way up. Uh, and, you know, uh, Balaji Srinivasan, mm -hmm. um, he is, uh, gosh, where did he get his start? Um, well, he's a tech guy. He He's the author of a book called The Network State. Uh, when he appears on uh, Tim Ferriss's podcast, it's always the highest rated episode of the year. And they tend oh, really? to be like, okay. you know, four and five hour episodes. Uh, he has recently made a prediction that within 90 days, Bitcoin is going to be at a million dollars. I think he's wrong. <laughs> I think it would be catastrophic if it were, because he says it's going to be as a result of a banking crisis that's just getting started right now. And, you know, this you say banking is it underlies everything. And I agree. Uh, but being, having been in a doom oriented, you know, mindset for a decade, uh, and then, you know, having lived long enough to see all these predictions of impending disaster not come true. If you look around, you'll notice that the, the preaching of impending economic disaster, the death of the dollar is perennial because people use it to sell gold or for a while they were using it to sell Bitcoin. But there's always in somebody's economic interest to be spreading fear about the stability of the economic system. So you, you will encounter people who have just, in, you know, who have just gotten the message for the first time and they are crazed. It's like, it's all coming down tomorrow. Look, this, this logic is unassailable. It's like, yeah, it's unassailable, but it was unassailable 20 years ago when I first encountered it and it hasn't come to pass. So, you know, if you want to get excited about it now, if you want to make rash life changes based on this, this mania right now, I recommend against it, but you know, you go and do you and let's talk again in 20 years. I'm not, a, I don't have a problem with what you're saying because the results are that are what you're talking about, right? This is why I had to take a step back. And then, you know, on the other side is everything you just said is true. But how long can the Fed just keep on printing money? How long can this thing? Because at some point it's going to, it's going to stop. But then is it just a phase shift onto something else with very smooth and we don't know about it? CBDCs. What does that look like? Um, yeah, it's, Look, I'm a, I was on the precious metals. I still own them. I look at them. I'm happy right now because the counterparty risk is minimum. But for the last 12 years, every time I look at it, I, you know, I wanted to uh, spit venom because you know, <laughs> like if I would have just invested in the S&P 500, I've been way above that. But it's like there's a almost a religious belief in this idea of markets that some people have that it just always goes up and always goes up. And it's like, no, it's cyclical. <laughs> well, look, know. look at the Bitcoin chart. I mean, look, look at the like all time Bitcoin chart. There is a very clear cyclical process of bull markets and bear markets. But with each new bull market, it climbs to new highs. I think that will continue. So how long is that? How long is that chart, though? A hundred years? No, I mean, Bitcoin was created in what? 2009? No, I'm, not, I'm, not Bitcoin. I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about like the stock market. And like, is it is that going back two, three hundred years or is that going back? you know, since like the thirties or to the tens when it, the most modern version. I, I'm not sure. I know that, you know, 
there are corporations that exist today that existed prior to the start of the 20th century, you know, that they're publicly yeah. traded. But I, you know, I think that if you're looking at patterns in the stock market, it doesn't pay to go back more than 30, 40 years because things have fundamentally changed in terms of just how, how stocks are traded, you know, what role they play, what role they, you know, the, the aggregate uh, number, you know, the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ or whatever, that has come to be, uh, in, it was stated explicitly, you know, in the Obama years as a, a stand-in for the economic health of the country, which is absurd, you know. It is absurd. Yeah, yeah. I think Crystal Ball on uh, Breaking Points has got it right when she says the stock market is really just an index of rich people's feelings. Yeah, yeah. they own it all now. Mm -hmm. They're the master. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems, again, I feel like I'm red pilling myself again, not even on the <laughs> red, but like on whatever of just everything. You know, I have an MBA, everything we were taught in grad school, undergrad. How, like it was it all seems like johnny apple appleseed things now where it's like well you what you really should have just done was trust the fed trust the power of the whatever they do put your money in there and yeah you're you're gonna invest in lehman brothers every now and again but they they just keep on marching along and i'm so disagreeable i hate that yeah but, i don't want it to be true but i don't want it to be true yeah. I, I want there to be these um fundamentals and all these things that they talked about and taught us and the Phillips curve and all these different things, but it's just, you lose money. <laughs> like bet the on market the can stay irrational longer than you can remain solvent. That's, you know, the old adage. Bet on the fed. And, right? you know, you're talking about CBDCs. Uh, I think what's going to happen is like today, most dollars that exist, you know, that exist, they don't have a physical instantiation. There's no bill to correspond to them. Um, you know, the Congress might be minting a trillion dollar coin, but, uh, you know, for the most part, these dollars that exist, yeah. they're, they're intangible. And from the perspective of most people, you know, going to Walmart, there's going to be absolutely zero difference in the experience of buying something with a current digital dollar from your debit card versus using a, you know, central bank digital dollar. Oh my gosh. It's, there'll be no difference. There'll be no difference. And then when they say, oh, you can only get four pounds of meat, they'll just go, oh, okay. Four, four pounds of meat is what I get this year. Uh, mm -hmm. For the first couple of months, they'll be pissed. And then they'll just, that'll be the new norm. And it'll mm -hmm. just go on. And I don't even think there'll be that much pushback. This is an anecdotal story, which, you know, means it's bullshit. But I was... <laughs> I was at uh, WeWork a couple years ago doing Amazon fulfillment with this group of guys. And there was a young, young guy, 27, 28, who knows? And he, um, good school. He was doing his own thing. He was there. We were chit chatting. Do you remember when Robin Hood took off the buy button for GameStop during the height yes. of that? Yes, I do. He could have cared less. Could have or could couldn't have. have. Or I'm sorry, couldn't have cared less. <laughs> it was, didn't mean anything. You know, oh, um, that's a weird thing that's going on. I'll never be in a situation like that. Screw those, right? And same way, the, the herd, whatever is, comes down, as long as they can continue watching television, get on their phone, they just won't care. And that's just a reality that I hate to admit, but I just think it's true. And that's probably what keeps this thing rolling on and on. Right. The, <laughs> convenience. Yeah. Convenience. And no one's no one wants to sacrifice anything, myself included. I'm not running down to this, <laughs> the state capitol and yelling at people. But I think the, the day of pitchforks and uh, guillotines is over. Yeah. Well, the power structures are too distributed. You know, there is no best deal to storm. No. Yeah. No. And so and, and now we're going back to like, what's reality? You know, the whole Jan 6 thing, the words that people use, like, was it a good look for us? No. Was it an insurrection people with iPhones <laughs> taking photos, waiting in line? Did they, did some people cause some damage? Yeah. But like an insurrection, that's 250 dudes with a lot of guns who have people in the military who are ready to like, right. That's like very complicated plan. These were knuckleheads. Mm -hmm. And and that's where we're at. It's it's comical how uh, we're the herd. That's just where I've gotten to. We are cattle, and this is just the new reality and plan accordingly. 
I think it was Ryan Grimm who made this analogy uh, when talking about is January 6th uh, an actual attempted insurrection? It's like, you know, what if you try to kick a field goal from 97 yards? Is that an actual field goal attempt? You're not going to make it. It's impossible. It, it will never work. But if you try, does it count? <laughs> does it count as a field goal attempt? Yeah, for certain narratives. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're the CNN narrative, absolutely. N not only that, but it was there was almost certain to work. You know, we just got lucky that it didn't work. You know, that the 97 yard field goal is certainly within the realm of possibility and right, definitely yeah. something you should be worried about. You should definitely yeah. spend a lot of mental and psychic energy on this fear. It's crazy. I, here's another uh, here's another thing that I see that is just it's so minor and you and I see them every day. So there's a, a YouTube channel called uh, TDLR. Uh, what is it? Too long. Didn't, TLDR. News. Too long. Didn't read. Yeah. Yeah. News. And it's a, it seems like a bunch of European uh, young people. And I, it seems British or something like that. And this was when the first the UK thing was um, first starting to kick off. And they were doing this like 10 minute long segment. And one of the lines was, and historically dovish Germany is now having to get involved. And I, on the comment, I was like, historically dovish. His history started when? <laughs> and they go, yeah, in like the last 50 years. And I'm like, okay, that's yeah. history. Uh, all right. That's an interregnum. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a coffee break from history. And people just swallow it and they just, again, that goes back to, I, I look at all these different things, this IQ, certain thing, curiosity thing. Jordan Peterson talks about the big five personality ocean. And it's just, I just got to take a step back and go, my reality is not the same as so many other people's. And the herd is in charge. And, and then when you realize that this has never been, this has always been the way it's been. The Romans, bread and circuses, they knew it back then. Mm-hmm. Why are we any different? That's a that's a tough pill for me to swallow because I, I want us to do better, but we just never will. There's a book that I read several years ago, <clears throat> and I'm trying to remember the author, but it's called Are We Rome? And it is a comparison of, you know, the Roman Empire to the United States. And, you know, it's prejudicing to say the Roman Empire because the Roman polity started as a republic and then became an empire, you know, after hundreds of years. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of obvious similarities and some of them are cosmetic and some of them are deliberate. You know, the so-called founding fathers of this country were very much looking to Rome, uh, and, and thinking about creating a new Rome and you can see it in the architecture in Washington, DC, but oh, gosh, I wish I could remember the author's name. I'm going to look it up right quick while I'm talking, but the author says, um, yeah, Rome started out as a, a slave polity. And it never changed. It never deviated, you know, from from that modus. And the U.S. started as a, a slave nation, and you know, completely rejected it. Completely did a 180 on that. And this is something that John Michael Greer, who's one of the few peak oil people that I'm still paying attention to, uh, you know, he says the the United States, you know, our founding documents and our structure are such that we can pretty much reinvent ourselves every 80 years as needed uh, and be a completely different country and yet still maintain the continuity of governance and the stability, you know, in the populace and in the economy because our founding uh, structure is flexible enough to accommodate that sort of reinvention. And do you think, do you think we're on ahead. the last cycle of that? No. I, do uh, I kind of do. I kind of do. I don't. I mean, as the way we know it, I think some of the principles that we've used for so long. I mean, watching the left kind of go after uh, freedom of speech is to me the most mind-boggling thing I've ever seen. Like that. Let the right do that. <laughs> they're the principal <laughs> advisory people, right? They're the ones who you know they're they've always got this um, the stick up their butt. But the fact that the left is doing that right now, these are the creatives. These are the these are the ones that push us forward because they're they have a high degree of openness and they're they're always trying to make it better. And now they're in that restriction restricted way. And I want I wonder if they can do some damage that just won't recover from. Like for example, like this um, them going after Trump, right? And. That's just that just opens the door for us to go out for both sides to go after every politician from then on out. I remember in the the Democratic primary debates for the 2020 election, 
somebody was asked, you know, like all the candidates were asked, you know, if, if elected, will you prosecute the further, the former president? And um, everybody basically gave a qualified version of yes, except for Marianne Williamson and Andrew Yang. And Andrew Yang said, look, there are countries where it's normal for the incoming power to persecute the outgoing power. We don't want to be one of those countries. You don't want to live in a country where that happens. That's not what we're about. Right. And yeah, it's happened. Uh, and, you know, to great applause from a portion of the, the population. So for the one guy who did not start a new war and I'm not, yeah, a Trump well, fan. that's, that's, that's among his sins, really. <laughs> yes. Like I'm not a Trump fan. He bailed out wall street. I don't care who he, this is why I don't believe in voting. No matter who you vote for wall street always gets bailed out. Yeah. And he, so I don't like him for that. And a number of other reasons. And yet he didn't start a new war. And this is the one that they're foaming at the mouth of go mm -hmm. after Bush. Right. After over, Cheney. over, payments hush money payments paid to a porn star like <sighs> yeah they're they're happy to you know persecute people for sexual indiscretion but yeah systemic uh you know the systemic behavior of this this whole apparatus can we persecute or prosecute one person and hold them responsible for that no not interested not yeah. bringing that up you, you've got a sexual angle we can pursue yeah we're all about that because it yeah. means nothing you know <laughs> Right, right. And yeah, you know, and maybe if they did go after, you know, Bush, that would be the can of worms that didn't have to go over everyone. And they're not willing to do that. And this guy is just whoever. I don't know. I mean, I look at Trump and go, he's the most famous actor on the planet. He's the most famous person on the world. And it just drives people crazy. And they're to your point, they're in that bottom thing and they're just rabid. And that just sucks because that just doesn't seem like that's going to end well for any of us. I don't know. I think when it comes to ends, you know, the, the saying, the, the ends justify the means. There are no ends. There are no ends. There are yeah. no ends. The story continues. So that's, that's where I'm in this like really bad, like what is reality? What, you know, where do you get to? There is no end. There is no end. There is no finish. You know, and at the same time, I think the last two years, if you're going to learn anything from what we've been doing is the slippery slope exists and be careful of it. Oh, yeah. And yet, yet there's no ends, like there's no accountability. That's crazy, too. There's no accountability. There's no um, there's no consequences for any action anymore. That's a weird just the facade of that coming down, even if there, that's always been the case. That facade coming down seems very unnerving. As well, well there, there are consequences for offending, you know, the woke sensibility. If you say the wrong thing, you can get fired. But I just watched this video about this uh, young black man who has over ten thousand dollars in, um, you know, fines for auto offenses. He's never had a license, still doesn't have a license, never had insurance. You know, makes left hand turns from the right hand lane in front of cops. Doesn't care about any of it always goes to court. He's always, you know, leveled fines that he doesn't pay. And, you know, there's a, a news crew following him around. They, they're, they were in court with him where he had a $400 fine leveled against him for driving without a license. And he walked out of the courtroom, got into his car for which he is not licensed to drive, doesn't have insurance and drove away. And uh, he knows that, you know, he's making the rational choice. These, these laws are unenforceable. The consequences are trivial. Uh, if I don't obey by them, you know, if I don't abide by the judgment of, of the court, nothing will happen to me. And he's right. And that's deliberate. It is, it is a deliberately engineered. I mean, if you want to get conspiratorial, I will say, yes, there, there has been a, a dedicated effort to instill racial hostility in populations where it had largely died, died down by not, but by encouraging bad behavior in one population and assuring them that they will never be held accountable and then holding a different population to state of accountability in terms of their thinking, you know, and their, their non behavior for the most part that, uh, you know, you can lose your livelihood if you say the wrong word where this guy over here can drive without a license for years, obey no laws whatsoever and never be held accountable. And here's, here's social media to just throw that in your face all the time and keep you angry. You and know? That, and, yeah. And that just pisses off. I mean, you, let's just say white people, even though whatever, let's just say that pisses off a certain segment of people who believe in right and wrong. And they're like, that's crazy. And I want to look at him and go, yeah, that's a, 
I get it. That sucks. But can we not talk about the bankers? Can we not talk about the ones <laughs> who are actually stealing money? Well, from that's you? that's anti-Semitism. You, you no, can't complain about the bankers. It's too, it's too complicated. <laughs> it's too co yeah. Well, it's too right. But the thought stopper is well. You're that's just coded language for you know hating Jews oh, to talk it? about the bankers. Yeah. Oh well, I guess add another list of people not to like me. <laughs> no, I mean, that's that's the thought stopper. That's what the, the establishment using woke lingo says. This is why you can't examine banking, you know, the, com the complexities of banking and finance, because if you do and you, you do it in a critical mode that you, you're really just hating on Jewish people. So are they saying that the Jews actually control the banking system? And that? Because no, no, they're just they're just referring to the right wing paranoid prejudice that says that the Jews are overrepresented in finance. OK, OK. Interesting. So you're not going to get them on a technicality. Come on. Okay. <laughs> They're right. not interested in intellectual consistency. You, they, <laughs> you can point it out all day long that they're inconsistent and they don't care. You it's like, like that four hundred dollar like, fine for you know not you, for driving without a license. Don't care. Not going to pay it. Fuck you. Yeah. I'm going to my car. Yeah, <laughs> I noticed that in so many things, and I just have to turn everything off because it drives me nuts. Do you ever listen to Jimmy Dore? I I don't like jimmy Dore very much i don't like his delivery uh, i don't like his his lack of intellectual rigor but i do hang out with people who enjoy him so i overhear a fair amount of jimmy Dore. there's a part of me that i just like he just looks at and goes when he looks at his audience and says if you vote for republican or democrat you're a chump i go okay now all right, that's good enough I agree. For me. i definitely right. agree <laughs> right like okay now i'll listen for a little bit i mean but if you guys, vote you know, whatever. But if you're hung up about it all the time, you know, voting is something you do every couple of years. It's one, it's a few minutes out of one day, every couple of years. If that's your full-time obsession, you're a chump. You're a total well, chump. If you think that someone's actually going to do something, I, I am whatever uh, on the internet, they say that Mark Twain said that um, <laughs> if voting made a difference, they wouldn't allow you to do it. I don't actually think you said it, but I, I completely agree that I think if you if you go to vote, you just wasted a dollar and a half in gas or maybe three dollars now. Like it means absolutely nothing. But anyway, depends. Uh, you, you have a voice in local elections. I hear that, but I don't. Uh, I I think there's some logic and some reason to that, but I think I've seen enough of local governments to go no, not at all. Like they don't. It means nothing. That's just my opinion. So I mm -hmm. I'm very happy to be wrong about that. Um, but like Jimmy Dore, like the consistency. You know, he accurately describes how corrupt politicians in the system are. The corporates, that, like he can keep, he can go and say it's corrupt for these reasons and he's absolutely correct. And then in the next breath, he'll say a million, whatever the number is, a million Americans died because there's no government health care. <laughs> it's like you want to give this, these people who you've accurately described as the worst of the worst, power hungry, money hungry, all these different things. And then you want to give them more power over it. And you think that's a good idea. Okay. Let's, let's see how that works. Knowing that you mentioned healthcare with the Colombian government here. So that might be something you take, uh, we could debate or argue about, but still it's, you accurately described how awful these people are, how corrupt they are, how much money is wasted. And then in your next breath, you want to give them more power, more <laughs> money and more ways for them to be corrupt. What are we doing here? Like, how does that work? And then you just see that in arguments all over the place. The right, the Fox News is great for that. Well, now CNN and the Miss NBC too. They just, they just always have conflicting things and they can't balance. They never have the a consistency to what you're talking about of a clear line. So yeah, I got to We just turn it all off. Uh, do you know a guy named um, Curtis Yarvin? Yeah, um, that dude is on <laughs> another level. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm a Curtis Yarvin fan. I, I enjoy I reading do. his blog. <laughs> I, and I'm I'm largely in agreement that democracy is a pretty shitty system. Um, and I think that you know, we don't really have it. We pay lip service to it. But the fact that we don't have an actual democracy in the United States lends to stability, that actual democracy would be very destabilizing. That's why I don't vote. That's 100% the reason why I think it's foolish. These, um, I, I think about the Klaus Schwab's and the WEF and the um, global corporations. And let's give the devil their due. They're very smart. They plan in terms of decades and centuries, right? They have um, 
just all these things. And you think they're going to allow us, the herd, to change that every two to four years? Are you insane? Like, yeah. Again, every two to four years, you have the opportunity to throw the bastards out and change nothing. Because it doesn't mean anything. Right. But going back to uh, Curtis Jarvin, I was blown away when he described um, his theory that. FDR, what FDR did to the government is still the government we have today and how he outlined that it's the bureaucracy that runs it and why the, why he uh, picked Truman after him. Did you read this one? Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I don't remember this one, but um, oh, I, I, I don't subscribe. I only read the free stuff. I gotcha. Um, he, he did an interview and he was talking about it. He said that FDR was a political genius. And mm -hmm. like any of the Caesars, Napoleons, whatever, when they were leaving their mark, his was he built this apparatus of bureaucracy that would run without any politician there. And his reasoning was, if you look at like Augustus, whoever, they want someone to come up behind them to continue on the legacy, who's as good as them and continue going. He chose someone who had no power, no influence to show I built a system that will continue right. to work regardless of who's there. And I don't know if that's true. You know, Harvard is never going to call me to be a political um, professor, but that was kind of interesting. And after World War II, after this apparatus started going, this bureaucratic, is that what they're calling the deep state? Uh, the, the red team is talking about the spies and all that kind of stuff. But it is those GS workers who have been there for 20 and 30 years. And if they don't want something to happen, they go, oh, well, I'm just going to need this in paperwork. Well, I'm going to need this in three. They'll slow uh, walk everything because they know they're in charge. And I go, well, that's probably, there's probably more truth in there than I even want to admit. So the deep state is a fraught term these days because it's been associated with the right. Um, but I, who, who coined it? Was it Carol Quigley? Or I, I'm pretty sure it was a left winger who observed that there is a uh, perpetual administrative body which is not susceptible to election and which persists regardless of you know whether there's churn at the top. And um, it's true. Now, the a complication with the deep state is that a lot of people, when they say it, they're also very specifically referring to the intelligence state. You know, they're, they're referring to espionage and they're referring to. Uh, aspects of the the military industrial complex that are not amenable to to voting you know that can't be changed by democratic means but i think in Tur curtis yarvin's terms you know he's a monarchist and he doesn't necessarily want a king but he would like a, a you know a president with the powers of a king basically or he, wa he wants the a noble class that he wants a noble class that uh has its ethos of service to the people in the country. And they have a sense of continuity that extends beyond their own lives. Whereas in a democracy like ours, you know, so-called democracy, if you want to say that, uh, policy proposals are governed by very, very short-term interests. You know, it's it's what happens this year, what, what happens for the next electoral cycle that is of utmost importance. And, you know, what happens 100 years from now? A president can't care, but a king has to care because a king wants his grandson sitting on the throne at that time. Right. Uh, so what, what's being described here is skin in the game. Yep. And the deep state has skin in the game. Yep. You know, if you're a member of the permanent bureaucracy and you're not going to lose your job regardless of what the voters do, uh, then you do have a long-term interest in the maintenance of the system. You, you're not realize, a short-term thinker like an elected official. Yeah, people don't realize how uh, bad that is in the military. <laughs> uh, generals right. have generals' kids. Like... If your dad's a three star, yeah, you're you might make one easy, two maybe depending how good. But there's so many like McCain. He's a good example. Uh, John McCain's father was the ad, four star admiral in charge of Vietnam, and then his father was a I'm gonna get it wrong, but maybe a World War One or a World War Two guy. That happens all the time in the military. People yeah. don't realize that. John McCain's probably not the best example there because uh, he paid a much higher price for his, you know, his position in a military lineage than most people do. Uh, you might want to read about, you might want to read about his treatment. He, I think he was kind of a scumbag all the way through. 
like even like, when he was captured. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he should never have uh, been downed in Vietnam. He should have lost his license three crashes before. I, I bet he, he wish crashed. he had. <laughs> yeah. Probably, I, mean, but. I mean, he's dead now, but you know, for most of his life, he couldn't raise his arms above his head. Which was from the crash. It wasn't from torture. Oh yeah. It's not something I've investigated. So go ahead. Tell me more. It was, it was an issue. I mean, again, reality, what's true, what's not. It's um story I read was the crash is where he sustained all his energy uh, injuries. They knew who he was. They tried to trade him. Uh, he's the public was, he said no, cause he didn't want to have all these other people, but it was also because, or he wasn't going to, the story was, was he wasn't going to allow to get returned just because of who his father was, not until everyone else went. And I think that's like the Johnny Appleseed story. I think there was right. a few things um, that were going on behind the scenes. I think he got shot down because he was just a, he could get away with whatever he wanted. He took a jet. His dad let him take a jet when he was a young officer to a football game, something like that, crashed it and didn't get his wings removed. He like he was involved in a blackout in Spain or something like that. Still didn't get his ticket um, removed. Like there was, there's some shady stuff that can go on. This <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, it's not this. He's a war hero like everyone thought it was. It, there's a lot going on there. If, what, what's in this can? Oh, look, worms. Worms, <laughs> worms in the can. Who'd have thought? Yeah. 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 It's crazy. It's how, what to believe. How do you believe anything? The story I just told. I wouldn't be shocked if that was a completely made up, but it seemed plausible and credible at the time. So who knows? Well, you know, we're, we're coming up on an hour and a half here. So I think we yeah. should probably aim it towards the exit. Yeah. Um, you know, summing up seems like you're grumpy, but in a happy place and, you know, physically. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely a curmudgeon. If I could be the youngest Andy Rooney of all time, I'd love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, Andy Rooney, give me a tweed jacket with the leather uh, elbow patches and I can give me five minutes to describe how humans disappoint me in every way. <laughs> okay. Uh, 60 minutes, I'm in. <laughs> I'm like, that would, <laughs> let me tell you how you failed life today. Uh, yeah. I, to your point, this thing just keeps on rolling along. There's not yeah. going to be an end. There's not going to be a Mad Max scenario. And, and if it is, like, at that point, who gives a shit? So I'm tired of thinking about it. And it's it's such a bitter pill for people like me or for me to swallow of, like, accepting what is. And no justice, no accountability, no all these different things. So you got to just make your own somehow and watch your YouTube algorithm and let it piss you off every now and again. <laughs> or just go on your way. <laughs> Talk to people like you and see what you think and help the asthma, your, um, your compass, get the right asthma on it and go, you know, help me not make huge mistakes that are going to have huge uh, consequences financially, health-wise down the road. But that's about it. There's, it's a weird world and we're just here to observe. So I don't know. And, you know, I say there, there are no ends, but each of us has a checkout date. And uh, we, we want to imagine that some process that we've been paying attention to our whole lives is going to come to some culminating moment before we check out. And there's just no guarantee. And in, in all likelihood, it won't. Yeah, the yeah, credits so. don't roll. There's not <laughs> exactly. Every rom-com should have like, after the credits, it should be a 15 minute short of how miserable they are five years later when they're used to everything. And you go, oh, that's how it turns out. Okay. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So or it, it well, should always was... end in divorce. Always, yeah. yeah. Every rom com should end, you know, with uh, the 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 two lovers with their respective lawyers just talking about how evil the other is. <laughs> I, I'm watching someone write an alimony check for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good catching up. I don't want to wait two more years from it, um, and I'll reach out more. But like I said, I just wanted to see what you're up to and, and kind of see where your head was at because I do want to make sure that I'm not getting into my own head where I'm not just seeing things that I want to see. So yeah. I put up a lot of YouTube content. It is, uh, 
it's lazily produced. It's just me on the smartphone. I edit right on the phone, but I yep. put out a lot of it. So uh, I'll send you a link to the YouTube channel. And if you know ever if I've said something that you disagree with, or you have more information about, or you just want to you know chat about it, let me know. Yeah, sounds good. I've got a TikTok thing that did kind of well. I kind of got tired of it because I was just doing the same thing over and over again. I'll send that to you. So we can. I don't currently right. have TikTok on my phone, but I'm not opposed to putting it back on there. Yeah. I mean, what do I care if the Chinese government gets it as opposed to Mark Zuckerberg to me? There, Yeah. I, I am amazed when I did have the, um, the TikTok app on my phone, I was astounded at how good the curation algorithm was at how quickly it figured out what it was I was interested in and served it up to me. Like it's much more sophisticated than Instagram. And I think Instagram is very good at that. It's fascinating what you can get on there. Um, you know, when someone, it's funny too, and people sell themselves out there like, oh, all it is is like girls in bikinis. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I got it. I'm like, that's what, you, that's what you're into. Man, current events, you want to talk about like military stuff. There's some great things on there. I've learned so much from that algorithm and it's, it's addicting, but it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. But, you know, it's like Russia today. You know, the Russian government will definitely be happy to uh, hand a paycheck to any American with some credibility who's willing to criticize the United States. You know, so. It's, yeah, OK, it's, I, I get that. But, you know, I'm seeing things where it says you type in Paris and Instagram and it'll show you all the like people on vacation. You type in Paris into TikTok and it shows you that the, the protests going on. Right. So, I mean, there's some differences. I appreciate well, it. I mean, the, the, the point is to tear down the Disneyland fantasy image yeah. that we are expected to hold and show us something closer to reality in this instance. You know, when reality is is detrimental to the well-being of this particular establishment, yeah, the CCP will happily show you a glimpse of reality in that context. 100%. 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. right, we could do this forever. <laughs> we yeah, got to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. All right, bud. Well, it was good talking to you. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's do it again soon. Yeah, and and keep me apprised because I do want to head to uh, a Spanish speaking environment again fairly soon. You know, once the dog has grown and maybe can travel, although she might be too big to travel, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. see. Um, I have a feeling I'm we'll be spending some time down here, so I'll let you know. Right on. Okay. Right. Take care. You take care.